Okay, we're going to get started again. I think it's, I think it's interesting that uh, how how well I think we we can probably relate to you guys and the culture you come from, having come from a culture that even though I'm sure it's got plenty of differences, has some similarities, because uh, they're probably both male-dominated cultures. Um, and the uh, culture that a man that I come from is a pretty hard-nosed culture. Um, the only uh, really type of ministry solution for every situation in the culture, typically, and in the church, is punishment. If it can't be resolved through punishment, then somebody is just in rebellion, you know. And uh, and so there's very little. And some of that is changing now in some of the culture, but there's very little acknowledgement for the need of healing uh, of of people's hearts and, and inner uh, damage and all of that. And so uh, they would end up instead of addressing those needs through. Uh, any kind of uh, um, uh, healing ministry or uh, trying to help people work through things, uh, they, they would end up in mental institutions, uh, they would end up on drugs or whatever because they didn't know how to resolve things through uh, inner healing or deliverance or anything like that. and. Uh, and so we were just talking a little bit about raising children and uh, uh, the, the only way really that parents in the culture that I was raised in knew how to deal with anything with children was punishment. And uh, which means you end up raising a lot of damaged children. You know, I was one of those children uh, I made a vow when I was eight years old that nobody would ever see me cry again. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I never cried outwardly from that time until I was 26 years old. And Jesus broke that shell around my heart and all that pain came out. And so that's not something that I think is healthy in a culture uh, to, to do that to kids. And so I think you guys are probably somewhere in that loop yourselves that we found ourselves in of having to find a healthier way to, to raise our children and, and to work together to do that. Uh, to not only, um, and, and one, of the, one of the best resources that I can probably recommend to you is a book by Danny Silk and it's called Ra uh, Loving Your Children on Purpose. Uh, and it talks about how to um, uh, instead of punishing your children for every wrong thing they do, uh, teaching them that their own choices are the consequences that they will have to deal with. That the consequences of their own choices are the punishment for making wrong choices. Uh, and rather than us being the consequences, yeah. our punishment being the consequences, their own choices bring them the consequences that they have to deal with. Uh, and so it's, a, it's more of an empowering culture where if you make good choices, you get, a, you get to live out of the reward of those good choices. And if you make bad choices, then those choices are going to bring the consequences that you'll have to deal with. And I think it reflects the way that God created us a whole lot better because the Lord never controlled anybody. And in the culture that I grew up in, control and authority were seen as kind of the same thing. And they're very different from each other. Um, when, and I referred to something that maybe was a bit of a trigger for some of you, I'm not sure, when I said that man is sovereign because God is sovereign. What that means is man has the ability to make his own choices. And when you have the ability to make your own choices, you are a sovereign creature. No, no other creature was created to be sovereign except man. Uh, huh? No, no other creature. Yeah, but when you 
you say man, it's man and woman. Well, it's mankind. Yeah. You understand? Man is a, <laughs> man, sure. man is a species. <laughs> uh, let's not get into the b biology. Yeah, well, I, yeah. <laughs> All that debate that's going on right now. Uh, anyway, um, so so as a sovereign creature, we get to make choices and to live out the consequences of those choices. And so when we're raising children, our children should be learning to, uh, to pay the, the, the consequences of right or wrong choices from the time they're young. And by the time they are... And this is something that we're dealing with in our church culture right now, uh, is uh, in Hebrew culture, uh, young people 12 and 13 years old are being welcomed into adulthood. And it's the most powerful time, of, powerful uh, time of their development is in that, their adolescent years. Uh, in church culture, for the most part, that's when kids tend to fall through the cracks and we lose it is in that age group. And so we're, we're in the process of, of dealing with that issue in our culture right now, not just the Amish, I'm not talking about the Amish culture, it's the culture our church is surrounded by, is how to reach kids at that age and to help them to become powerful in their development into adulthood, to where at that time they're actually f discovering their identity discovering who they are, making powerful choices that, that they're going to be experiencing the benefits of the rest of their life, rather than uh, feeling overlooked and disregarded and falling over, because the, it, we're discovering that it's during those years from 13 to 16 years old is when most people make a decision for, for the Lord that lasts for a lifetime. If we lose them during that period of time, we've lost them. And so we're dealing with that right now. Uh, but I think that's also reflective of a culture that we can raise children in, uh, where they're uh, not handicapped because parents make all their choices until they get eight, to be 18 years old. And then all of a sudden they have to make their own choices and they don't know how to do it. But we're actually empowering them to make powerful choices as they're growing up. And the older they get, the more of those choices they get to make for themselves. Does that make sense? Give an example of allowing them to make their own choice and to then to deal with the consequences of those choices. Uh, well, I, I just read a book, uh, I think it was Danny Silk, one of his books. Um, he was saying how they had moved to a new um, area and they had a, had a young teenager and he was going to, I think he was homeschool and then he went to public school and it, or maybe he was just able to go to uh, the football. He was able to be part of the team. And um, he, I mean, it was really scary for him and his wife to, to let him go out and be part, because he was very passionate about football. And then um, he, um, the team was uh, going to go to a neighboring town to visit uh, another, to, to observe another team you know, pl playing. And he wanted to go. And um, and they and they all of a sudden the, the mom and dad were very you know nervous about oh my they remembered what they got into what those types of trips were like and it's it's like they felt very vulnerable as in letting their their teenager to go and so what they decided doing was that they sat and said um, you know son um, mom and I are very makes us very nervous to to let you go but. We are going to trust you and, and let you go because um, we know that you, 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 know, you care for us, our hearts, and we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna trust you. But just know that it's very hard for us to do this. And so he ends up going and they come back and he picked him up and, and he was like, um, um, he, he had so much fun and, and he said that most, that he said, the most uh, thing, the thing that most impressed him was their uniforms, and and but the, the, their son came back and says, uh, "Dad, thank you so much for letting me go, and for I know it was hard for you and mom to trust me." Um, that was just that came out of a 
uh, example as a relationship with, with parents that would also come out in the church. You affirm them and you believe in them and it's a relational thing. It has to do with the relation, relation, building a relationship and trust. And I'm going to share, and, and this goes back, when, when, when you're talking about um, empowering these young people, it's also so much, it starts really with the family. But I just want to share something with you. Um, so all, all three of our older children. So for those that don't know, we had three children that were very close together. And then we had, 12 years later, we had another child. So. So Zach, he is now 23, and he's kind of grew up as a as an only child with five parents, you know. But um, um, but our older three, they went off to college, and they had a really, you know, they were very much involved with their groups of friends, and they all decided, you know, they had talked about they wanted to. Um, uh, their goal was to stay, uh, you know, keep themselves, be a virgin by the time you know when they get married. That was their goal. And they talked about it in their friends. And uh, when my youngest daughter, uh, she was started dating first. And she told me later, she says, Mom, um, you know how you are, you know, when you're dating and you're so much in love, it's really hard to, to not go there. And she said, the one thing, this is, she, she said, in my mind, um, we would process and we would like, we, God would forgive us if we slipped up. But she said, you know what kept us from not going there? It's because we knew we either had to lie to you and dad and our friends or we'd have to tell them the truth. And we couldn't do that because we valued, we knew you believed in us too much and we didn't want to, we valued the relation. We didn't want to disappoint you. That is what, what it talks about loving your children on purpose, building a relationship that way. It comes out of trust. It comes out of um, affirming. And, but anyway, that, that was just, I, I just, I, that really impacted me to realize just what um, getting to the heart of your child and trusting them, teaching them to trust you, and sometimes, um, that is what, it's It's not about controlling them or making them feel guilty. It's out of, and that's our relationship with, with God. We we yield to him and we, did not, you know, we, we die to self and we pay the price because we don't want to disappoint God because we value our relationship too much. So I don't know if that makes. It has to be about more than the rules. How do you feel yeah. that uh, I'm young kids, you know, like, I understand that the older you can do the, those decisions and you can like talk more about this, but how you can, uh, how can you like um, relate this to young kids? Like okay. for like, for example, five five years. Old. Okay, my daughter has a child. Her oldest is very uh, a very intense child, very much out of his head. All right, and she has been amazing. But what happens is when they started. Um, when he was growing and he would be rebellious, when they spanked him, he just like had meltdowns. And he would start hitting back and he started hitting himself and they, it didn't work. And, and those, uh, the father, um, his father spanked him one time and he like totally ignored him, wouldn't even talk to him for like several days. And um, they knew this is not a normal, I mean, this, they gotta find a way to do this. And, uh, and so what they started doing is they would give him consequences. And at that time, food was very important to him. And so they would give him choices. Uh, you know, they had different things that they would do. Is like, um, if you, um, they, they taught him how to manage his emotions, calm down, you know, to, to take a, you know, if he would be disrespectful, she, she taught him to, she would say, you want to try again? Do you want to lose? You know, she had um, certain, um, he had to, every day he was working for something special, you know, and, and by that day. Like, it, like snacks and things. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 if he, and if he wasn't listening or something. If he made a poor choice. Yeah, if he made a poor choice, then, then he would lose one of his, you know, I mean, he one had so many privilege. chances. So he was making that decision. 
And so um, there so the, are... So the choices were laid out ahead of time and the consequences for bad choices was laid out ahead of time. Yeah. And then when he was, when they saw him heading for a bad choice, they would tell him, oh, okay, remember this is the consequence for your choice. So it was him making the choice, not the parents. Yeah. He was making the choice that would end up with the consequence that he didn't want to deal with. So basically you have some rules in the house? Yes. And uh, for example, you allowed to watch TV? Like, yes. And if they like make a bad choice, you like take the, away the... Yeah. the and they, get, they, they lose their screen time yes. or whatever. And yeah. usually they have a couple choice, you know, maybe three tries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time, okay, I've lost. Okay, that's one strike. And then the third time, because you don't want to be too rigid, but teaching them to their their actions are have consequences. And usually, you have to just kind of move count, that away. Count the cost, which yeah. is a kingdom principle. And it's you are yeah. raising such powerful children when you, they learn to manage their actions, and they have what they realize. If I if I mess up, I it's only me that has to. You know, I'm the one who has to pay for it. I have to take the consequences, and uh, it helps it. it they, they're growing up to be powerful, and um, and learn how to do life, and not, you know, I just had so to. So instead about of them growing up to be angry at parents or angry uh -huh. at God because of consequences, they have only themselves to blame for poor choices. Yeah. So have to they have to learn to control their yeah. own impulses. Yeah, we are not. Uh, we are not. Also, we're we're not against spanking. That's not what, but there are some of those children that are, it doesn't reach them. Mm -hmm. And and you have to, um, and it's so important as parents too that we model action to them because, you know, as a parent, you can get frustrated and you can yell at your child. And so you're right there, you're modeling to them what's okay to do. And so it is a very much about us also owning our, and we walking a, a, a Christ like, you know, we are an example to them. And, um, yeah, so that, but there are some really good resources that out there that just kind of help you uh, be very practical and... Um, going going yeah. back where we started, when I said God made us sovereign, uh, I don't remember ever reading in scripture where the Lord said, you will. He never said, he always said, do this, and if you do, you will be blessed, and if you don't, you'll come under a curse. And so he always let us pick our choices and the consequences that he'd already laid out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So good. God's not a control freak. If he was, the world wouldn't be in the mess that it is, but he'd have a bunch of little robots for kids instead of sons yeah. and daughters. And as a child, too, when they're little, you just start little. You, know, you, you can't like do a revolutionary thing happening overnight. It's just you, you start small and... Um, and I think, yeah, it's pretty amazing, yeah. Uh, the picture that I'd like to leave with you is in, uh, in Genesis 1, 16, it says that God made two great lights, one to rule the day and one to rule the night. Um, they're both ruling lights, but they rule over different dimensions. In Genesis 37, verse 9, it talks about Joseph and the dream that he had, where he saw the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. And his family understood what the sun and the moon represented. That was dad and mom. And, uh, and so I like to use that in Genesis 1 to illustrate that dad and mom are both called to lead, but they lead in different dimensions. They're, they're anointed for leadership. There's not just one leader in the home, there's two. And the, your children understand that when they're little, when they're growing up, mom and dad are both leaders, but they lead in different ways. They lead with uh, uh, in different realms. And often uh, the man is gifted to lead in the visible realm. Uh, and in the vision realm. Uh, and the woman is gifted to lead uh, often in the spirit realm. Often the woman is actually more intuitive, is more in touch with what's going on, has a keener gift of discernment many times. Often the woman senses a, the moral character of somebody before the man does. 
uh, because she's gifted in a different realm than the man is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and often the woman is more in touch with what's going on in the spirit world and, and is more discerning of what's going on in principalities and powers and is quicker, quicker to pick up an atmospheric uh, presence that's dark because she's gifted in a different realm. And so uh, she has gifts in the man and, and, and anointings that the, the man does not have. And, and I'm saying often, it's, it's not hard and fast. Sometimes uh, it's reverse. And it, it, it's reverse, but often it's that way. And, uh, and Amanda and I have had a, a long journey of discovering how our giftings work together and actually complement each other. And, and we do best when we work in teamwork. Uh, and often when we're, when we're ministering to other, we're, when we work together, we're more effective than either one of us is alone uh, because of how we're gifted differently. Uh, and so I want to encourage all of you to discover what makes not only yourselves, but each other tick. Uh, and discover the giftings and allow the Lord to bring giftings alive in each other because both of you in every... A couple in every relationship have giftings that are necessary for you to fulfill the assignment God's called you to together. And you might think, well, it was just a, we're just together because I was attracted to her or whatever. No, actually, God put something in you to be drawn to a certain person that He had for you. The Lord was involved in that, it wasn't just you. And so, because he was had a design to get, that he had in his heart for the two of you together, and how you would complement each other, what would you would be able to fulfill as as one whole man. Uh, we used to there was a prophetic word that was spoken over us many years ago, over th over thirty years ago, uh, where this prophet said that that uh, he that. We were, he, he, he saw that we were wired very differently. But he said, the Lord's called us to be one whole man with his head in the clouds and her feet on the ground. Yeah, yeah at that time, too, it was kind of funny, too, because Jerry was, you know, he had this profound uh, encounter with God, you know, instantly said it's set free. And, 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 um, and, he was always, his head was in the cloud. He was always like spiritually like, you know, talking about God and praying and, and, and Re when, revelations, yeah. you know, and, um, what God is revealing, what he's saying. When that prophetic, when that prophet said that, I see you, Yuri, with your head in the clouds. And he saw me with my feet on the ground. And I'm like, well, it's a good thing that somebody's got their feet on the ground because, no, who would take out the garbage, you know? <laughs> you get what I'm saying. I mean, because he wasn't, he wasn't practical at that time. And, but over the time, it's amazing how he, I began, my head got, you know, I was more in tune. I got more in tune spiritually. And Yuri's got, you know, practical, more practical. And so that was, um, you know, those are just different. I, 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 had, I thought I wasn't, I was very lacking in spiritual. I wasn't very good uh, Christian because I, I um, compared myself with him. But I was, I had to learn that I was just wired different. You know, I'm very intuitive, like about heart. Like when I have a conversation with somebody, you know, I want to hear, I want to connect with the heart. And I actually taught it's, Yuri it's how to do that. It's more than that also. Yeah. She, yeah. She's also very gifted prophetically. Uh, she has open vision. She's she's extremely gifted. She has a keen uh, discerning of spirits, uh, and, and so she's extremely gifted yeah. uh, as well. But I am very connected with uh, what I'm feeling, and I don't know why. And I'm very passionate about health and wellness. And you're in like just give me the God, God will heal me. Anyway. Yeah, he's like just <laughs> give me the bare facts. I'm not interested. I just got in healed of arthritis. Yeah, that and I then, battled with for like yeah. four or five years, and it's. Just in the past month, it's completely gone. And then this is my, what I say, well, I said, praise God for your healing. Now you better start changing your diet so you can he keep it, right? <laughs> anyway, so it doesn't sound very spiritual, but it is. It's very much what the heart of God is. You know, there's, it's not just, anyway. It's all good. You still love me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would maintain the healing. Yeah. 
sometimes, yeah, that, that's another, that's kind of a little pony that I have that I ride sometimes is that you can get healed, but if you're not going to change your unhealthy eating, then your heart condition is not going to, you know, it's going to come back, you know. So, yeah. She has to walk in her faith, and I'll walk in mine. Yes. <laughs> That's right. You're doing good, though. Yeah. I am doing good. He does hear me. Yeah. Okay, questions? Comments? Uh, I think you feel some arthritis. Is that a story? Pardon me? Sorry. Oh, arthritis is something you have a story. Oh, boy. Uh, I, uh... I started battling with it a number of years ago, and uh, Todd White actually had a word of knowledge about it that revealed what my, the source of my joint pain was. He prayed for me, I didn't get healed. A bunch of people prayed for me, declared over me, I didn't get healed. So a month and a half ago, I took a team down to Peru, and, uh, and we went you know, 10 hours on a plane and then another 10 hours on a boat going down the Amazon to the city where we were going to be ministering to uh, pastors and leaders from about 100, 150 mile radius that would come together. And we took them through an intense week of teaching, training, activating. Uh, and uh, it's a region that we've made a commitment to help uh, develop churches and leaders. And, uh, and then in the evenings, I would, I preached at the public meetings in the evenings. And, uh, and the first evening, the Lord had me focus on witchcraft. And so uh, I preached hard against witchcraft to the pastors and leaders. And, and most of them came to the altar and repented for allowing that in their culture and uh, for allowing it into their families. Because it's just an accepted part of the culture. You know, you go to church on Sunday and you trust the Lord. And then you go to, if your kids get sick, you need to go to the shaman during the week, you know. So they repented for that. And then the next day, uh, the Lord said, I want you to hit it again. I'm like, okay. So I hit it even harder the second night. And I got the, many of the pastors repented for not only allowing it, for, but uh, made a commitment that they were going to confront their families. They were, they were going to get that thing rooted out of their churches. Uh, because on the one hand, you're praying for revival. On the other hand, you're tolerating witchcraft in the church. That's, you, you can't do that. There are two spirits that are diametrically opposed to each other. And so they repented again and uh, made, made some really strong commitments. And the atmosphere shifted in the meetings when that happened. Uh, we, we had a powerful week the rest of that week. And then uh, we went up river 10 hours. I got on the plane to come home and all the pain left me as I got on the plane. And so I'm like, well, you know, I didn't get healed when people prayed for me. Didn't get healed when they, uh, people declared with authority that that uh, it was, that thing was broken. But I got healed when I, when I refused to allow that to distract me from God's purpose for my life. And that releases a, a, a grace into your life that nothing else will. Uh, I think if I would have said, well, I'm not going to travel, I'm not going to do missions and, uh, until I get healed of arthritis, I'd probably still be battling with it. Uh, but then a prophetic brother, I was sharing with him the other day uh, and told him the whole story. And he said, you know, I really feel like uh, that arthritis coming off of you had to do with the witchcraft that you confronted. Uh, that from the time you first started dealing with witchcraft in South America, that thing attacked you uh, with arthritis. And this time you broke through it and it came off of you. And so I believe that's very, uh, I believe that's right on because we've seen before that, that witchcraft actually empowers arthritis, especially and also kidney issues uh, when uh, uh, attacks of witchcraft against people especially front lines people that are doing the work of the Lord. Uh, that witchcraft assignments against you will, will often end up bringing you joint pain and kidney issues. So. Yes? Can you share a few um, testimonies how you face struggles with your children?
So. Our youngest daughter uh, was 14, 15 years old. Um, our kids were raised in church. They were raised by parents who didn't believe in compromising in their commitment to the Lord. And so you, you just assume kids that are raised in that culture are always going to have a heart for God and all of that. Uh, but she got up into her like junior high years, or high school years, early high school years, and she was came into total rebellion against us, and uh, and we didn't understand what was going on. It was like, what, what, uh, how, how could this develop in our own house, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'll try not to make. A long story too long but uh, the Lord had me uh, the, the Lord instructed me on what was the cause of it where it came from and it came from a generational assignment in my family I come from a my mother's family was involved in witchcraft it was similar to a Peruvian culture or witchcraft was a part of the culture it is with the my, my grandfather was a medicine man he was the one that People would take their children, their babies and children too, and he would mumble words over them to heal them of earache and tummy ache and whatever. And uh, and they just assumed that it was of the Lord, but it was actually a spirit of uh, uh, a spirit of witchcraft. And uh, and so that was very strong in my mother's family. And so the Lord told me is that. Uh, Whenever there's supernatural intervention in the affairs of men, there must be a sacrifice. And uh, in other words, pagan tribes, uh, you know, when there's a sickness, a disease, a plague, a famine, they would offer up a sacrifice to their God, right? I used to, I always thought that was just a satanic thing, just an occultic thing. But I began to realize they were actually honoring a spiritual law. That whenever there's supernatural intervention, there has to be a sacrifice. And you even see that all the way through the Old Testament with the Hebrews. First thing they would have to do is offer up an offering. You know? And uh, whenever they came to a new place or into a new venture, uh, they would have to build an altar and offer up an offering. Well, then Jesus came as the Lamb of God and He gave the perfect sacrifice for us. And so we're actually the only religion on earth that does not have to offer up an offering for supernatural. We're the only culture, a religious culture in the world that is legally entitled to live a supernatural life. And we never have to pay for it because it's already paid. Does that make sense? But in the culture that I was raised in, uh, there was a witchcraft in the family. Somebody had to pay the price for it. It was me. I was the sacrifice in my family. I went through a lot of suffering growing up as a kid because I was being targeted by the enemy for destruction because of the witchcraft of the family. And what the Lord explained to me is that target was passed down to my daughter. And when I asked the Lord, what do I do? How do I deal with it? The Lord said, if you'll do what Esther did, I will set her free. So okay, well Esther fasted food and water for three days. And then she went into the cave. That's what I have to do. So I fasted food and water for three days. And the third day I went before the Lord. I said, Lord, I want this stronghold broken off of my daughter. I want this stronghold of witchcraft broken off of my family once for all. And, uh, and that day, something, something shifted with my daughter. She told me later, she said, I was doing drugs. You guys didn't even know it. And she said, from that day, from the day that you did that, I, I, for some reason, I couldn't touch them anymore. She, she, she was not able to touch drugs from that day on. And I'm going to share just a little bit about her because she was, she had some friends, two girls that she would hang with, and um, she uh, very isolated, you know, just them and stuff. And she would lie to us and go out with her friend, but then go to parties. And she was doing drugs right, right, right under like. His her siblings and we did all the signs were there but we didn't we didn't 
Yuri knew, I mean, he, he, they knew his story and he knew that they would never touch it. <laughs> but she was doing it. And, um, and so that happened first. And then the Lord broke up the relationship with this person. Just it, She did something and because all of a sudden she was changing. When, when that was broken, she couldn't do drugs there, anymore. There was an ungodly soul tie between her and her best friend at the time. Yeah. And when the Lord devastated that soul tie, she was released into freedom. But she started, um, she started, uh, and then she, she couldn't get along. Like it, it wasn't like smooth anymore. But anyway, um, uh, she uh, the this her, her girlfriend did was doing something and anyway I remember my daughter saying we will never be friends it'll be never be like what we had before she said it and um, and and that weekend Yuri um, so she didn't want anything to do with her with her friend for some reason and Yuri was gone and she was home just her and I and and she came out of the bedroom and she was crying and she says, Mom, she said, I don't know what is going on with me. She said, I hated Dad. And all of a sudden, I just realized I just love him. I just love him. And she said, I was, I don't know why I was feeling that way. Because she said it was almost like a fog just lifted out of the room. And she's like, um, and she she had uh, was listening to these, um, like, feed the children uh, she was watching a commercial about Feed the Children, these little children. She can't cry, and she's like, Mom, she's like, I just want to go do something. I want my life to count some, for something. I just want to go and help those little children. She's like, I. whenever I thought about uh, missions, I would think, who would want to waste their life to go on missions? And now I just want to go, and I want to help them. And and, and she, it, like, she, it totally changed. She went to school, and... Um, and all of a sudden, she was reaching out to all, she saw all the little kids, the, the, well, the, the high schoolers the, that, that were that overlooked. And, and she started like reaching out and just affirming them. And, and, um, and she, um, she got chosen for, what was it, on the prom, you know, the, uh, not, uh, the, the um, court, you know, you have the prom king and queen, and then you have the, the homecoming, the, one, court. the homecoming court, yeah. yeah. She got chosen out of her class, like 80% chose her. And she did not fit the bill. Like usually it was these little cheerleaders, you know, that did it and popular girls and she got picked. And then, um, for instance, um, this one girl uh, that she'd been just being friendly and affirming, um, she was a self-proclaimed lesbian. And, and so she came up and she said, she told my daughter, if, if there was um, a, I forget, uh, so you, you know how you, you put best something, you know, in the yearbook, yeah. most likely to achieve and all this best, whatever. She said, she was telling Christy that she voted for Christy for the, for the, the homecoming court. And Christy's like this. This is what, how my daughter Christy's heart was changed. She's like, she's like, you know, if there was a best lesbian, I would vote for you. In, in other words, she uh, just loved her. She just. She had lesbian friends, atheist friends, and they all that, loved that actually, her. Actually, some of some of her friends actually came to faith because she was able to love them when they were rejected. It just, by the she rest just of the students, totally so. transferred. I mean, yeah, it, it was like an overnight transformation for her. Yeah. And um and and yeah. So hearing from God is critical yeah. for parents. You know, it's so important. It, this is more than just a good idea. It's critical to raising children. You have to hear from God. Yeah. Prophetic gifts are important. You yeah. you need to learn to know the voice of God. Have your gifts fully animated. If you yeah, uh, the the future of your children and grandchildren depends on you allowing everything that God created in you to come fully alive. And God will help you take that apart when there is something there, but. The biggest thing is to, I found, is to affirm them and let your child that is in rebellion, they know that they are doing wrong. But when you begin speaking who they are, you know, how, how much, how proud of you, you know, how you're proud of them and how you love them and you're so glad that, you know, you start affirming them, it changes. Some, every, there's something in every person alive that longs for affirmation to be valued. And that is like the, 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 the I think the most impactful thing that we can do with everybody around us is we begin affirming them and not necessarily 
focusing on their shortcomings, but affirming them, and especially our children. There's something that comes alive and their walls come down and then they begin opening their heart to you and you get to minister the heart of God to them. You know, so yeah, I would say that is like the affirming. And we always had that. I had this, she had mostly had this thing against her dad for some reason. And, and um, I was able to still like connect with her heart. She was able to open her heart to me to a certain degree. But um, so mothers, that we, 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 we have a tremendous influence on our children. Yeah, yeah, we still have uh, about half an hour. So, uh, and, and, and I'd like to offer any any of you that would like, you know, just prayer for your relate. If any of you are really facing challenges and you'd like to be prayed uh, prayed for, or whatever, we'd be happy to do that as well. So. And I would love just some feedback what we share because we share and we're like, I hope we're it, it's helping somebody, and I hope it's inspiring. So if even if anything that we shared that kind of like was an aha moment or just that you, um, it spoke to you, we'd love to have some feedback. You know, we need affirmation too, right? So that we're on track. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But yeah, I would love to hear if there is something that. I want to share. I really like what you guys said that it's okay to be different that you can complement each other because very often we're trying, okay, you're with someone, you're trying to be the same, that, oh, this person has a gift in this, why I don't have it? So it was really nice to hear that it's fine to be yeah. different and complement each other. So thank you. And thank you for being very honest with us. We can see it. Yeah. And t kind of tagging on to that, uh, Conflict in your relationship doesn't mean you're not supposed to be together. It's an opportunity for you guys to work through stuff and grow in your relationship in the process. Actually, if your if your if your relationship is too smooth, then I would tell you I encourage you to go a little deeper <laughs> because <laughs> it's actually and Yuri would always say that it's not about learning it's not about not fighting it's about learning to, f to fight the good fight. fight with good results fight to resolution not, yeah not to hurt each other but to resolve and to work through and to grow in the process yeah. Yeah. I really like how you guys did the, the asking the question back is this correct that was I've mm. never heard that before that was really Definitely something we'll take into our practice. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for definitely uh, being open, like uh, sharing your struggles and things like that. Uh, very personal, you know, I know it's hard to, especially when you guys are up there, you know, you're teaching and sharing with us, sharing your mistakes and, and the things that, uh, you know, that you went through. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely difficult. It makes you vulnerable. Um, but to us, it, it makes it real, you know, it makes... Yeah, and we see that we can, you know, you guys have been married for 40 years, and we can definitely see that, you know, it's possible that we can grow in our marriages yeah. to that point, you know, oh, because yeah. we see it, we see that it's it's real life, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. that you're not just vague in what you're saying, you know, um, just covering up with, with, you know, these phrases that a lot of people use, we're actually sharing that for real life, you know, yeah. so we really appreciate that. Yeah. And usually when you are... Um, feeling like you're you're bumping against each other and there's conflict. Usually, it's not the situation, but it's 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 triggering a, a, a wound, a trauma. You know, because we're raised, you know, we grow up in things, and our parents have done the best they know how. But there's we come to perception, we we come to conclusions about things that is not truth, and God has to like touch it. He has to kind of bring it up so that he can go there and dig it out, bring it to the surface so that he can heal and bring truth to it. Just like he showed us that I was reacting because when Yuri would raise his voice and kind of dig in his heels, I was being triggered because that's what my dad did with my mom. My mom would never stand up to him 
and, and she'd go cry. We'd, uh, we'd often, you know, come into a room and she was crying. And, and, um, and I, I'm like, my husband is never going to do that. And, and so that would trigger me and that would make me like respond like, and then he, like he heard his mom because his mom was opposite. I mean, his family life was opposite. His mom was the one that was more of the, the dominant role. And so when we began understanding that, and we would often say, when he started, he, he's like, honey, I am not your enemy. And I'm like, you know, that was like, okay, yeah, all right. And then we would, and it also is a commitment, and it takes energy at times to talk something out. And we also talked about how I would want to talk about it right away, and he, he needed to process. But, um, you know, so we had to learn also to, you know. Give each other grace. And we can't use that, okay, just because we're an inner, we're an out, out um, we're uh, like either a verbal processor or a inward, we cannot use that as, as an excuse not to go there. We have to work for the other, for, you know, we, we can take a little time, but we do need to be, we can't just forget about it and act like it's it's okay now. you got to come back and you got to talk, talk about it and you got to take the, show up and take the time to process it. What was also really good is when you guys talked about uh, listening to each other and repeating that same question just to, to dig, dig deeper to understand what they're actually asking. Like uh, the image I got to share with my wife was kind of like playing ping pong with that question, you know, just back and forth, back and forth until we finally yeah. reach that understanding what this is actually about. Yeah. That, that's really and good. usually it's something about a wound inside you. That's what we have to remember because we can change our verbiage and we can try to make it so that it doesn't trigger but really not helping that other person come to the thing. And I'm gonna be um, kind of, Yuri would often, at one time when he, when he would often say, don't tell me what to do. He, he didn't, you know, don't tell me what to do. You know, that was his response. And so I found myself rephrasing things, like you might wanna think about slowing down or you might wanna think about taking out the garbage. I was constantly trying to Phrase, do my phrases, phrase my, communicate, yeah, my sentences, so he wouldn't be triggered. And I later, we realized that I wasn't, I wasn't enabling him by, you know, I was trying to, to, to be sensitive, but really he was, until he realized, oh, wait a minute, why am I doing that? What, you know, and that, and now he doesn't, he never, he never tells me that. I can tell him, honey, you need to, you know, take the garbage out. He, it doesn't trigger him. But, because he wants to, he, he knows I'm not trying to tell him what to do, right? He knows my heart. And so because of that, he allowed that healing to come. And uh, so that was really powerful there in that way too. Especially, how do you do that when your life is full of kids all the time and yeah. you don't have time alone away so much yeah. and all of that? And uh, sometimes I found that the key for me is not so much in trying to find, uh, even though I value alone time, and sometimes it's, sometimes the best alone time I have is when I'm on the road by myself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in learning to walk with God rather than sitting with God. Yeah. Does that make sense? In other words, I live my life in His presence, and when I'm always in fellowship with Him, always in communion with Him, I don't necessarily have to have time apart in order to spend time with the Lord. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and so even when you're raising your children, that's something God wants to be present with you all the time. Uh, and always wants to be counseling with you, always wants to be fellowshipping with you, always wants to be instructing you. And, and so uh, just because you're busy doesn't mean you're not with God. 
We, in fact, in the middle of our business, God wants to be there with us. He wants to be walking through those circumstances with us and counseling us and teaching us and instructing us and giving us wisdom. And so I just want to encourage all of you, and, and that's not the easiest thing to do sometimes, but learn to do everything that you do with the Lord rather than, oh, this is my life and now I get to spend time with God. You, you understand what I'm saying? I think that's really good too and that I, I feel I mean that question is very personal to me too because I um, I would feel guilty that I didn't you know have that be able to spend that time and then when I did have time my, my mind was going like crazy you know all these oh don't forget to do this and you've got to do that but I did um, I think one of the key is to be practice being present inside your head because the Holy Spirit is such a, I mean, he, my, some, when my children were little, my biggest uh, downloads from God was when I was doing dishes. I would be doing dishes and I'd be thinking about thoughts and different things that I was struggling with. And, 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 and I, and you pay attention what you're doing, what, cause I, I, that's how God, sp I heard his voice. I'm so sorry. What? We got a dishwasher and we robbed you. I know. Now I do it with my other son. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I think all of us, we need to practice hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. I think that is the key. And really, um, you know, in the busyness of life, when, we're, you know, when you're present inside what your thoughts are going, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. And it's just somebody told me it like this. It's like a radio, and you're and you're you're tuning in different stations. And when 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 there is an issue in my heart, and I need answer, and Lord, I need an answer. I need to show me your perspective. What are you doing here? Now I have it out there. I need an answer, right? So now it's there. And as when the Holy Spirit, I tuned in to that. I want to hear God in that area. Then when that thought comes, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I recognize it, and I don't miss it. So does yeah. that make sense? And so I think that's one of the, uh, that, that's a gift as a mother. You're there and, and, and God wants us to practice hearing him in the busyness of life. And I'm, I'm going to also add to that. You need people in your life that you can process what's going on in your heart with. You, you, need, you need at least one person that is a friend, a peer, someone that's a safe place for you to open up things that you don't open up to other people. Hopefully, one of those is your spouse, but you also need, uh, a woman needs a woman. Yeah. Uh, a man needs a man. Someone yeah. that he can open his heart up to that understands what a man goes through. Uh, someone that, uh, another woman that you can open your heart up to that understands what a woman goes through that's a peer and also as uh, another one who's a mentor. Uh, an older woman, an older man, someone who can speak as a father or a mother into your life. Those, those are very uh, valuable resources that every believer needs to, to uh, find those safe places. Not just someone that's here today and gone tomorrow, but someone who's in covenant relationship with you and committed to your growth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, th those are very valuable things. Yeah. Vulnerability is like the key. Learning to be vulnerable and you need a safe place to be vulnerable that person's not going to judge you if you're going to have these negative emotions because that has to come out so that you can see we were taught that there's certain attitudes and emotions that is not godly so you put it in this bottle and you shove it you know you push it down and you put a lid on it and you just keep a lid on it but eventually it's gonna it's gonna come it's gonna erupt and what the holy spirit wants to is he's bringing that stuff up so that he can speak to it and so the way he does with me is I need somebody that I can pro I can just share. And that person knows I'm not, I don't need them to fix it. Just hear me. They will encourage me. Um, but uh, there's no judgment. They're not like, you know. At first when I started doing that with Yuri, you know, when I was going through my depression, I remember I was, uh, I, I said this to Yuri. I said, I don't know why I bother praying to God because he does it. He does whatever he wants in me anyway. He makes me so miserable 
that I have to give in in order for, to get peace, you know? And Yuri's like, oh, I can't believe you said that, you know? And, and, but when I said it, you know, I'm realizing, oh, this is what I'm feeling, you know? I didn't know I was feeling that. But, but I was raw. I was, you know what I mean? That was what I was feeling. It's like, I don't know why I bother, you know? And, but then, you know, Yuri has learned to say, honey, you know, um, just, you're gonna, you're gonna come out. You're not gonna stay. Sometimes it's just like you're not gonna be here all the time. This is gonna pass, you know. And um, yeah, but I, I was, say, I mean, that's what he said. It's so important that you find somebody that you can just be honest and open and sharing. And shame is what keeps us from doing that. And yeah. vulnerability is what helps us uh, attack the shame and be free from shame. What you're, what you're struggling with in your and, life. And it Whatever does it happen sometimes with you, when you're dealing with your husband that is really being stubborn or something. You need a safe place that you can just vent. I'm, I'm kind of being facetious, but you know what I'm saying. Yes, we do need to have somebody you need, you need that... You need to exercise wisdom. But not in... You know. I had to be very careful because I was a leader and I couldn't just find somebody. I had to find somebody that is not gonna, that knows Yuri's heart that is not going to judge him by what I share. So that is very, very much impo important. And, and, and your children and whatever, you need somebody that is not going to go judge them or share. But it is important that you're able to, to share. Yeah. You take tiny steps. <laughs> you share a little bit, and then you, then they share back. It's kind of I think we have thing. I think we have a sense of where the safe places are in our life. Yeah. Like one person said, before you pour into a vessel, you better make sure it doesn't leak. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so true. And and all of us should endeavor to be as what I call a sanctified altar. Yeah. In other words, if we're we're the altar that people offer things up out of their own hearts on that it should burn up on that altar, it shouldn't be spread around right. mm -hmm. the church community yeah. or the family or whatever. Yeah. It should stay on that sacrificed altar and be offered up. Every one of us should be a sanctified altar for people to come to. And I think that is a really good way to find that person for us, is if we can be that for those around us. Mm -hmm. That we're vulnerable, that we are not judgmental, yeah. that we have an ear, that we hear and encourage. And then you'll find yourself people coming and opening up and then you'll know what, who you can, and you'll share some of that stuff, but then there's some stuff that you'll wait and not, just only uh, certain. And I normally don't share anything that I'm wrestling, that I'm struggling with. It's only after the fact that I've come through my victory that I share the, the, what we are doing here tonight. Okay. 30 years ago, uh, the Lord asked me to submit myself to a pastor that he had called me to serve for seven years. And I really struggled because I knew this man was not perfect and I didn't know why the Lord would have me submit to somebody who wasn't perfect, who didn't have it all together, you know. Uh, the fact is none of us are perfect and the Lord requires our children to submit to us, you know. So so we never have some a perfect parent to submit to because there are none. There's only one, you know. And, uh, and I'm like, Lord, you know, why would you ask me to do something like this? And, and I heard the Lord say, you know I've called you to be a father. And I said, yes. And he said, before you can be a father, you have to be a son. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And he, then, he said, and then he raised the bar even higher. He said, if this man ever learns to trust you, someday I will learn to trust you. And he did. And earlier this year, I did his funeral. And the Lord told me 25 years ago that I would be doing his funeral, and I did. And I did his wife's last year. And, uh, but they learned to trust me because they learned to know my heart, and I served them out of, out of a heart of love. And so those relationships are very important and very powerful in shaping us and forming us. So. 
Why don't I, why don't, why don't I pray a prayer of blessing over you, and then if any of you have time, we can pray for you individually. Yeah, okay. and if you do. Father, I thank you for all these men and women of God. Today, I just ask for your blessing over their marriages, over their relationships, even those who are not married yet. Father, I ask that their the foundation of faith that they build on would be strong and powerful and true and vulnerable and authentic. That they would not build on anything that's not real, anything that is uh, dead material, but that it would be living stones that are their foundation, stones that, that are brought alive by revelation, truth, and life. And, and Holy Spirit, I'm asking for you to be in the middle of every relationship, leading them, guiding them, directing them, teaching them to know your voice, uh, uh, allowing all of their giftings to come fully alive, uh, for them to become strong and powerful, to be an example uh, in, in the midst of a culture uh, of people who are hungry to know the voice of God and hungry for the to know the purpose of God, that they would be an example of men and women uh, of renown that are hearing your voice, uh, that are living a life of high adventure, that their relationships would be rich, strong, and rewarding and fulfilling, and that you would take them places that they never dreamed that they could go because they're allowing you to be the one who leads and guides them and directs them. And let every one of these relationships be a living testimony to the relationship of Jesus and his bride. Yes. As Father, that, that would be so alive and so powerful for them that you would take them into uh, the nations of the world with that revelation. And we'd bless them in that journey. And we ask, Lord, for, for wisdom in raising their children. We ask that you would uh, cause the gifts of the Spirit to be fully alive in every way as tools and weapons in that warfare of raising children that are going to stand against the forces of darkness and be beacons of light in the dark world. And we just bless them in that journey and ask for incredible wisdom to be poured out on them in this process in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.